on the New York Review of Books, and you have this article on your Moodle page. It's one of your um, recommended readings. I believe it may be uh, required. I don't remember right now. Why is the assault on reason so attractive to some feminist thinkers? Four reasons, I believe, can be offered for this. Then she goes on to say, first, these feminists, these feminists, like many other critical social thinkers, have been influenced by French theorist Michel Foucault. Remember Michel Foucault that we talked about last time? <coughs> Michel Foucault, and by their criticisms of reason. In my opinion, mistakenly, these feminists believe that these opinions, which try to reduce reasons for a conviction to causes of that conviction, and claim that arguments merely reflect the play of social and political forces, have in them something liberating and politically progressive. Let me clarify what this means. Okay, this is an important statement. So she's saying that these opinions by Michel Foucault and the postmodern thinkers try to reduce reasons for a conviction to causes of that conviction. You know what? Um, I think I think we should raise I should we should raise your fees the students fees here at Cal State uh, probably three or four hundred percent and the reason is that we teachers need to get a better salary so as to offer you a better quality teaching it's for your good it's really for your good that we raise your fees and we should raise them you know doubled or tripled them for next year that's exactly the kind of thing okay so reasons. The appearance, in reality, what is hiding is causes. I want this, but I'll present it as good for you, as a wonderful thing, it needs to be done, yes. So there are, you never trust reasons. That's the position of Foucault and these radical feminists. When you want something, it's just raw force. If you're stronger than me, then your arguments are better than mine. If I'm stronger than you, then my arguments are better than yours. But the arguments themselves don't count. That's the idea. But this, this feminist, not Martha Nussbaum, is critical to that position. Okay? And so his, this, this, this opinions that, that reduce reasons to conviction, sorry, reasons for a conviction to causes of that conviction, and claim that arguments only reflect the play of so, social and political forces, the radical feminists believe that this has something liberating and progressive. But one might argue that if argument is to depend on the play of forces, the weaker will always lose. If reasons and arguments don't have any power, it's just raw force, what's behind that matters, then the weak will always lose. And the radical feminists would say, right, you got it right. That's what happens, right? What the weak seem to require is a situation in which reason prevails over force and is given special respect. The radical feminists would say, oh, how nice, how lovely. But it doesn't happen that way. Now, the radical feminists and the postmoderns might now reply that, as a matter of fact, this never happens. And it is liberating, at least, to recognize this fact. But to this, one should say that this is false, that this is mistaken. And that to make such dire claims as if they reflected inevitable truth is likely to make them come true. So her position is that if you keep saying that, that arguments don't count, that all that matters is how much power you have, you're going to make that come true because people are not going to believe about, and on argue, about arguments anymore and they're just going to say, how many people do I have on my side? More than you, then I'm right. Well, these ideas have had an impact on minorities uh, during the 60s and 70s and 80s and even today. And I would say a, a, a positive impact because the fact is those with power have always found ways to justify the oppression of others, whether racial minorities or women or gays or something. And when these minorities have 
finally said, well, look, yeah, we listen to, we've listened to your reasons, but your reasons always say we are under here and you're up there, and we're not going to take that anymore. And so we have our own reasons. Well, they follow this, this Foucaultian process, and, and it's been liberating for them. Uh, there's this feminist disagrees as to the, taking it to the very extreme, as the radical feminists do. Okay? Now, second, feminists working in philosophy note that the philosophical tradition has existed alongside patriarchal and oppressive institutions. And then they mistakenly conclude that the philosophical tradition is to blame for these abuses. And her third and fourth arguments against the radical feminists are pretty much an elaboration of this point. It's very, pretty, much like, pretty much like saying, okay, you want us to trust reason, but look at the philosophers all the way from, you know, from uh, ancient Greece. Look at the philosophical tradition of the West. What, is, what, what has been their conclusion, their objectivity, what has their objectivity and their reason led them to? Always to place men here and women there. Did you call that objectivity? And then Martha Nussbaum goes on to say, well, not always. Some philosophers have argued for the equality of women throughout the Western tradition. So anyway, as you can tell, the point is not all feminists agree with the radical feminists. But we have to acknowledge that the radical feminists have gotten some interesting points in there, even if you don't agree, or if you don't agree with the extent to which they take them, say, by criticizing even reason, our ability to be objective. So, um, radical feminists conceive of all men as being part of this conspiracy to subjugate women. All men, it's an all male conspiracy. And that includes homosexual men too, who according to Dorking, conspire through fashion, by controlling women through fashion. And it encompasses um, also pacifist men, or it doesn't matter how nice you may be, if you're a man, you are part of the conspiracy. However, there is at least one man who has been acknowledged to be a radical feminist. At least one. John Stoltenberg. John Stoltenberg. Now, <clears throat> just by telling you the title of his books, you will understand that he is truly radical. He really deserves a place of honor among the radical feminists. Okay? One of his books is called Refusing to be a Man. Another one is called The End of Manhood, in which he says, he states, that he hopes to see the day when men no longer exist. Truly radical. Okay? In fact, so radical that to my surprise, I noticed that Pornography, Men Possessing Women, the book by Andrew Dorkin, is dedicated to John Stoltenberg. And then one of my students in one of uh, past semester um, did some more research and found out that John Stoltenberg, who, wa who is gay, was married to Andrew Dorkin, who is a lesbian. Yeah. <laughs> we have some deep schemes in there, okay? We don't know very much about what's going on in there. But anyway, I'll tell you that once, just as an anecdote, I, I lost this book and I, I left it in the classroom, in the desk when I left. And of course, the book has annotations, highlights and everything. And so um, I needed to get it back, so I called the lost and found department, which is the police department, and I had to tell them I had lost my pornography book. <laughs> so you could hear the, the officer <laughs> tell, hey Joe, did you see this pornography book that this religious studies professor left in the case? <laughs> uh, it's pretty embarrassing. So now I'm really careful not to lose it <laughs> again. <laughs> Why is the book called pornography? Well, because of all things, 
the radical feminists 